Hey again, everybody, it's Susan. And I wanted to offer you a little, a little practice that combines all of the first five principles of Wellspring that we've discussed. So the radiant heart and channel, that getting established into the center of your core and expanding out in every direction. The strength of your wings as you spread your wingspan and fill up and push from the inside out, how strong you can get in the arms the rootedness in the wings and the forward tip, the anterior tip of the pelvis to give you a nice open strong pelvic floor and a healthy curve in your lumbar. And then finding the belly, the length of the waistline and the neck getting really extending out of the rooted hips and between the crown of the head rising. You start to feel these two areas of the, the body get really taut. And then a pulse of movement that comes into the body when you start to really work the push and the pull, the root and the rise, that tug of love, I like to call it, of the bowspring, where you pull the hips down and back and you rise the ribs up and apart. And that's that tug of love that helps you get so strong and so integrated from the center. So I think it's important that when we go into these practices, when we start to change our patterns and look at a different way of holding ourselves, that we consider the things that we do all the time. Those things that we take for granted, those things that we overlook really easily, and how we place our hands on the floor when we go into tabletop position, or how we sit down when we come into the beginning of class, and how we can easily just replicate exactly how we're sitting at our desk all day long when we come to sit down for the beginning of a yoga class or a bow spring class. It's really easy to go right back to pattern. So, and I mean standing. I know there's a whole movement today with stand-up desks going, right? Where the, the, that's great because it keeps you moving, but the perpetuated habit is now this, where the knees are locking and our butts are coming underneath us. And so we go into this completely disconnected position and we hang out there. And we're not sitting down, thankfully, but actually we're still sitting down even though we're standing up. So we've got to look at those things really, really honestly because we don't want to be perpetually in this tucked under position where we're just not in a position to go or to be dynamic. With bowspring, we're really dynamic. So we start standing, we have a chair, we have access to a wall and access to a table. So two different places there, the wall or the table would be good depending on the height of the shoulder movement and range of motion you have that's healthy there. Now I do want to say, of course, you always want to make sure that you're healthy and that you check with your doctor before you start anything. But this exercises, these exercises are so universal through the body and so low impact. In fact, we're taking pressure off the joints, but still so strengthening that everybody can do them. From as young as you can stand up to as old as you can even stay in a chair and put your hands on a table. So as long as you know that you're feeling good, your breath is with you, you're safe to do these mo motions, movements, just make sure you stay in contact. I'd love to hear if you're having feedback. So, all right. <clears throat> and as you bring your fingers together into that first position, I want you to let the ribs really expand out to the side. So that first position of just integrating yourself from the middle comes from you coming to attention, standing at present moment. So you bend a little into the knees just to give you a sense of push up through the crown of the head. You root the hips and that gives you a rise. And then that sets your central column, that sets, it, which is as wide as your neck. You wanna remember how wide that column is. So that starts to set the undulating column upward, your central radiant channel, up and down to give you connection both to earth and sky. And then once you have the radiant heart, Fingers push together and the elbows pull wide to give you a lift and a movement from the back and the sides of your heart, giving a little side to side, I call it the wiggle effect, where you keep rooted hips, but you pull one side at a time out of the hips. So you get that nice long line from the waistline up to the bottom of your rib cage to give you a little wiggle, a little movement, a little freedom up top. And then opening through the arms, sit your hips back a little bit more. So you find the arms reaching forward, the ribs almost pull back in opposition and then touch the fingertips down together again. Close your eyes as you inhale, press from the back of the heart and reach and then exhale, bring the fingertips back together again, keeping wide through your collarbones and wide through your shoulder blades. 
Do a couple more as you inhale, feel the back of your heart push, and as you fold in one finger at a time in your seed hands, you can really feel the tissues up the arm from the bottom of the ribs stretch. And give yourself the rooted hips behind you, bending at the knees so that you keep that, that downward pull as you rise upward. And then lean forward, after you've done three or four of those, lean forward and take recovery pose, where you have your hands against your thighs. Notice that the tendency as you lean forward is to go right back into our office chair again, right? Go right back into a seat that's very patterned. So you wanna keep your hips back. So from that extended open position, you got long through the belly, we're gonna get into the legs here. You're gonna lean forward, making sure you hinge at the crease of your hip and not moving any lower than you can keep your belly long at a healthy curve in your low spine. So once you're in recovery pose, you can press the thumbs inside and the fingers outside the legs. You just wanna lift one heel off the floor. And you can even slide it forward a few inches, but try not to look at it. You don't need to see what it's doing. Although it is nice to make sure that the toes are always on the floor and the top of the foot is relaxing. Sometimes you'll see the tendons pop and flare and that's just the nervous system patterning and we're just chilling out the edges, trying to relax the foot down. What happens is that there's a lift underneath the arch of the foot as you relax the toes down, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I just want you to dig and then drag. This dig-drag action is where we start to really feel the whole of the leg light up. So my hands are against my thighs, but I'm not bearing a lot of weight. My ribs stay so full that I don't need to put any pressure on my wrists or my elbows or my shoulders. I just have one heel lifted and I dig the foot forward like I'm sticking my foot into mud and it gets really heavy and forward and it's downward push. At the same time, my groins are gonna go back away from my bent knee. So it's like I'm pushing forward, but that helps me to sit further, further and further back. Then you can always take your hands to the bottom of your glute muscles, right? The low part of your glutes, top of the hamstrings, and then drag your heel backwards towards the wall behind you and feel your glutes lift up. You dig the foot forward, you drag the heel back, but your foot doesn't ever really move against the floor. It just stays connected, stays rooted. Try the other leg. Dig the foot, the knee bends, the groins immediately go back in opposition, and it's not kind of back. Sit as far back as you can, and if you feel like you're falling over, just don't lift your toes up. Keep the bottom foot toes really grounded so the tops of your feet can stay relaxed. The left heel hovers, so as you dig forward, you can feel the underside of the foot start to lift away from the floor, and then drag energetically the heels backwards, and dig, drag a couple of times, and you're gonna start to feel the feet light up, the legs light up, and the base glutes all the way up to the hips start to tone. Now see if you can come back to the upper body, lifting through the ribs, toning the fingers, widening through the elbows, and then dig both feet. And as they dig, the knees bend and you sit your groins way back. So you're moving way down and back away from the arms which are almost reaching forward. And then when you drag, you feel the glutes light up and you can stretch the belly a little bit longer. Stretch out of those rooted hips. Now take your hands forward to the table. And as you do, walk out, but you don't want to collapse heavy on your fingertips. This is one of those things that we do often. We do a pattern, especially if we go to yoga classes or we bear weight ever. When we take our hands down, the tendency is that everything collapses on us and we lose all the work that we just did. So we like to come onto just fingertips, just a dome position where the fingers, each knuckle is bent. So you're not hyperextending in any way, in any joint, in any part of the body with the bowspring alignment. So when you take your dome hands, like you're holding a big cup or a softball underneath your palms, feel the fingers squeeze energetically together. And they don't move, but you'll feel the base of your thumb mound and pinky mound light up, which directly follows to the tricep and the bicep lighting up, which directly then facilitates a lift and a widening through your upper back. So the way you place your fingers and squeeze up the arm is allowing you to get more fullness in the ribs. And you can see again, I'm just wiggling side to side, giving myself a long waistline, keeping the knees bent and rooting my hips back so I have a nice healthy curve in my lumbar, never letting my ribs collapse forward, always staying full. Now I'm gonna just pull my wrists down we call these bright hands, where they're fully connected on the perimeter, but the dome at the center stays lifted. So I'm always trying to lift the center palm of my hand, 
even as I drag and pull the wrist back away from the fingertips. Now, I could just lift and lower my hands and do these little push-ups this way, but I really want you to think about the movement of the ribs because we're going to go from dome to bright a few times. Dig, drag into the legs, get your groins way back, and then inhale, fill the ribs and dome your hands. And then keep the ribs filling up and exhale, brighten the wrists to the floor. Inhale, dome, exhale back to the table. And keep the ribs rising and moving forward, the hips rooting and moving back, so that as you dome and bright and the ribs never collapse, you're gonna start to feel the nice long chain of your waistline light up as you root and rise. These dome to bright push-ups give you a lot of strength in the arms. One detail is that you never want the eye of the elbows to turn forward. You always wanna make sure that the eyes of your elbows are facing in. This is every time you're bearing weight so that the outer elbow rises a little bit. When I take my palms to bright and even come a little more vertical, the tendency is to hyperextend more. So you wanna keep the outer elbows lifting. You can always play with walking back a little bit more and then going dome to bright and just checking out your bowspring, checking out how full or light your ribs are. If you're coming into this hyperextended finger position, you're heavy in the ribs, too low and collapse in the back of the heart. So you always wanna be able to move the hands as if they're not bearing any weight and then let the back body be what lifts you up. Instead of doing this, where you're rounded when you come up and the back body isn't toned at all, you wanna be able to lightly touch from the fullness of the ribs, lightly come back up. And my whole body is working as a unit. So these dome to bright push-ups are really nice and then you can walk back, but it's not getting into that familiar pattern of just dropping in the shoulders or collapsing. Bend at the knees so you can push the pubis backwards and push way high through the tail, but as the bright hands are rooting down, you can really lift and lengthen through your belly and chest. And stretching through the neck, I like to even think push the tongue up into the roof of the mouth. So you keep the neck long on all sides, and then the pulse. Exhale, root the hips, press through the arms as you inhale, rise the ribs. Dig into your feet as you sit back, and then drag into the heels as you rise up. With strong arms, full ribs, and this root to rise pulse, you're gonna start to build a lot of heat. But again, you wanna make sure that you're not dropping or collapsing the chest, or overly lifting the tailbone, or the chin rather, or over tucking, and letting the tail come underneath you. So once you've done a couple of those against the table, you're gonna to start to feel your belly and your chest nice and long and lifted. And then you wanna keep that and we're gonna come sit into the chair. With your groins leading the way, your pubic bone like an anchor, hinge your body forward. Take your hands against your knees so you can really support the movement backwards. It's gonna feel a little bit weird at first, but you're gonna lead with your pubic bone as you sit down. Just a couple of those reps. Leaning forward as you sit way, way, way back, you can lift the arms up. And then like the table was there, press down through the arms and lift back up again. Then you can sit way, way back and even hover above your chair, that's more interesting. Press the arms down and lift the chest up. Let the arms rise as you root the rib or root the hips. And if you sit down, keep your heels hovering. Keep a little bit of groundedness through the feet without getting heavy on the heels. And then press the arms down and rise up. Couple of those, again, you're gonna start to build some heat and you're starting to train the muscles on the back chain of the body and up the spine to hold the curves upright rather than just allowing the collapse. Inherent in this alignment is integrity. Inherent in the way you hold your body in this alignment is accountability. So once you're down after you've done a few of those reps, sitting on your chair, just take a breath, give yourself a moment to settle again from standing to leaning forward to sitting. We're still into very familiar things that we do often, all day long. So these are really where we wanna have the most healthy mo movements, the most healthy range of motion. Because if we just go back into yoga postures and you know doing a lot of poses during a class, and then we come out and we just go back to our regular posture, there's not a lot that's translating from the mat into our lives. So we kind of bring what we do on an everyday basis to the mat, 
really, you don't need a mat. You can do this everywhere, but think about that. I'm going to practice sitting. I'm going to practice standing. I'm going to practice sitting up and standing down, or standing up and sitting down. I'm going to practice those things that I do every day, and I'm never going to take my shoulders or my knees for granted and really look at those places along the body and along the spine with a discerning eye so that you can stay in good patterns. So now when I'm sitting, nice and wide through the feet, and I always want to mold and connect my glutes to the direction up. They tend to mold under. When we sit back on our tailbone, the glutes tend to gather and get really sticky and hard and weak underneath the sit bone, really towards the front of the sit bone. And actually, they don't get hard. They just get kind of mushy, but hard to mobilize, hard to engage, hard to activate, right? So when we literally get our hands in there and we pull the flesh back, we're starting to direct them in a new, in a new uh, trajectory up to get a healthy curve in the back. Now, the feet can go a little wider apart, and again, try to stay on your toes, not high up tiptoes, but just on the balls of your feet more, so you can get that dig-drag action constantly. It's a little more challenging when you're sitting, because you don't have to look for the muscle support as much on the back of the legs, but just know that you can still keep that tone. Now, we're gonna get a little more into the hips. Left foot slides in, and the right ankle crosses over that top knee. You want the foot to be pretty far over so the toes can actually point down to the floor. You, the toes will have a tendency, if you, don't, if you don't cross enough, they'll point up and that'll sickle the ankle. Sickling the ankle can actually weaken all the way up into the pelvic floor. So you wanna keep the toe angled more down as you cross the foot all the way over the knee. Now a lot of times when you get into this cross ankle position, like a figure four, people immediately tell you to push your knee down. That's often the cue to get your hips to open. I want you to do the very opposite. You can in fact take both hands interlaced around the knee, the opposite or the lifted knee. That'll just help you keep a little more support for the rib cage even. Keep your elbows bending out to the side so your wings can still lift and spread and then lift your chest, your whole rib cage up, throw it open. Now, as I'm pulling my knee up in towards my belly, I'm rooting and widening my right sit bone a little bit more. So I'm actually getting to increase the depth of my femur into my hip socket. As I hold the knee up and root back, like I'm trying to pull my butt back into the right, I can even do that with my right hand to continue molding. But what happens is I really can deepen my groin line from the outer hip to the pubic bone. And just lifting the knee, keeping the elbows wide so the ribs can lift, and rooting down through that side of the pelvis, that pubic bone anchors, you're gonna start to feel some strengthening in that hip. And I really do believe that strengthening is so much more important than first than, than finding flexibility. So we look for strength and integration first, then we can increase the range of motion. Now, it can be you can still push the knee down, but you want energetically to be both, the push and the pull. So I'm pulling up against my knee as I'm pushing down against my hand. That will light up your legs quite a bit. And then you can do a couple of breaths there, keep leaning the pubic bone down and rising through the ribs. And then if you can keep that engagement, knee press pulling up, but also pressing down, at the same time, you can start to find your arms, your wings reaching opening and closing your fingers into seed hand, just like you're pumping the arms up, pumping, and every time you open and close, your belly gets longer and longer, and then you can take the hands to the top of the head in prayer position or to the sides of your ears in ecstasy, right? So we call these crown hands or ecstasy arms, and the elbows have a wanting to go wide, a pattern of really squeezing together and wide, or together and back. So you wanna push the shoulder blades apart Similar to how you do globe hands, when you embrace and encircle the area in front of you, you want to push the elbows out and forward in your ecstasy arms. That way, as you pull the fingers forward, it goes into the elbows and the head pushes back energetically. Then you can start to work a little back bend, keeping the standing lifted knee rather a little bit up, root down through the hips, and just play with your bow, opening the front body and leaning the hips and the head back. Little wiggle effect and then inhale, come back up. Uncross the right foot and dig drag immediately as the foot goes down so that you keep the tone in the bottom leg. This leg has a tendency to go passive, especially when it's not actively getting the focus or the stretch. So keep the bottom leg active and cross the left ankle all the way over the right knee. Now hold the knee up a little bit. You'll see that I don't give you a lot more cues than this to pull up and to push down. 
anchor the pubic bone because that's really all it takes is getting a few movements of toning with the align or a few breaths of toning the legs and the hips with the thigh bone in a healthy place in socket with the tip of the pelvis in that healthy forward tilt so you have a good curve in the low back and with the full rib cage and then you breathe make sure your toes on the lifted foot are relaxed standing foot as well they're nice and relaxed to the floor the lifted toes are pointed to the floor but you still have a hollow at the front of your ankle so the foot is flexed flexed the ankle is flexed but the toes are relaxed i'm lifting the knee up i'm sending my groin down those two actions as i really pull the hips back and i can always use that left arm the left hand to mold the glutes <clears throat> So as I lift and root, knee up, groin down, I'm gonna to start to feel that healthy integration around my socket. So we're finding strength. And just strong, integrated hips are mobile with healthy range of motion hips. So we don't have to go right away to stretching the hips. Like think about a traditional pigeon pose. We go so quickly, heavy and collapsed into our hips there. But we really wanna build strength. And as the thighs root and the glute muscles and hamstrings are toning, all sides uniformly, that's gonna give you a healthy open hip socket. Now, when you wanna go into a back bend from here again, keep the knee energetically doing the work. So the hands don't have to do it for you. But as the arms lift, don't let them go passive. Don't let the ribs drop. Keep up, 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 up. As you push the hands open and close, open and close. And then you can take ecstasy arms. Elbows in and then push up through the roof of the mouth. Think lift the back of your rib cage up so that you get a support for the heart to open to the sky. Now you can hear that as I lift my chest and throat, I'm still able to speak. But if I just throw my head back, I have a strained voice. And so you always wanna do the voice test, right? In classes, I often had people sing ohms when they were in their back bed, right? So to be able to clearly resonate along your central channel, no matter how far back you go. And this is so nice to counteract the other eight hours of our day where we're sitting rounded over a chair or our computers or wherever it is where we sit and however we sit right so when you come into you know you can do all of this in your office or anywhere that's convenient for you where you're just using the places that you have all the time right to work with getting a nice workout getting to, to really look at the places that you're using and the ways that you carry yourself all day long and making those patterns change a little bit because we're gonna do the first side one more time, we're gonna take a little bit of a twist. So top ankle is the right one, left foot is dig dragging, organize your glutes. So you pull the flesh in and up to the sacrum and then just for memory's sake, knee up, groin down. Now a little extra add-on, bring your left hand to the right heel and kick the heel into your hand. And as you make that action, there's again that skinny jean tone that rises all the way up the leg. So that's the dragging action, it's just that the foot's not on the floor. So dig drag is always in play. Now I'm gonna turn my ribs a little bit and I don't wanna kink the hose, remember. I wanna keep my back ribs really full. So with my right hand still holding the knee, I bring that elbow wide. So as that widens my shoulder blade, then I can move my ribs around a little bit and get some more length on both sides. Then I can hold my ankle or my heel with my right hand. But I wanna have more space on this left side. So I can either use the table that I'm next to and press down or like the arm chair, the chair of the arm. You can push down into the side of the table to lengthen the left side, the side that you're twisting towards. And then watch that instead of lifting your chin, look a little down and let that be a different stretch for your neck. So then the twist comes really from the rib cage. So you can push into the arm that's on the table and twist, or you can bring the hand behind the head, bow your front body really long. So in ecstasy position, you push the head into the hand. You're still arcing to the right so that you then twist up and to the left. So there, there'll be a lot of different things that the body will try to do when you, when you move through this range of motion. But you go bow, head back into your hands, arc, the left side gets longer, bow your front body again, and then twist your chest around the ribs, around your central column, and then bow your spine again, front body really, really long. Then come out of it on an inhale breath, mindfully holding the same shape and the same lift that you just created. Place the foot down, 
Dig drag right away. Get those glutes to light up. Cross left ankle again over right knee. Hold up on the knee and then pressing the hand, that right arm hand against the left heel, kick the heel in towards your bum so that you can tone up the leg. That whole effect of the leg slides up to the hips and then tip the pubic bone down. With the knee on the rise, you can really root through your hips. And then keeping the elbow widening, spin the ribs a little bit, cross to ankle or heel, or you can even just hold calf muscle, because if you notice that you're rounding your chest to try to get to some obligatory goal, you're losing the point, right? Inherent in our practice is accountability to our alignment, is integrity at our best. So we only go to a healthy range of motion that we can still breathe, voice test, and still have movement and agility at the core of our ribs. Once I've got across my body, hand to the head, I'm gonna press the head back, lifting up all the while the sternum, the rib cage, and then I'm gonna to lean to the left so I can open up the right side. That's the side I'm twisting towards. Now look down so you're, not, you're sure not to lead with your chin or your eyes. You wanna keep the twist coming from the back of the heart, the base ribs. Press the head back and then turn on the axis. Lean left, hips rooted, head back and then turn around the central column. Lean left, rise up as you press the head back and twist right. And then a couple of breaths there. Try not to go to the fullest range of motion at the beginning. Give yourself a couple of breaths to go deeper and deeper into it. And then make sure your chin hasn't gone too fast. The elbow on the right arm is reined in towards your face and you get a long channel through your spine as you twist. Inhale your heart back to center keeping enough gas in the tank always to get home safely my dear friend Anne says all the time so it's a beautiful line to remember to come out of the postures just as smoothly as you came in uncross the feet now if that was so easy for you and you'd rather a little challenge by all means you don't need the chair right you can do that exact same practice with the hips moving back but know that the pattern very quickly especially if your balance is a little unsteady the first thing that's going to happen is everything closes in on itself. It's just a pattern of protection where if we're not sure, we're conditioned to brace and hold on. So if you're doing that off the chair, by all means, be close to something steady. You can use a wall or use a table so that you're not tucking and bracing your balance by going out of alignment. You can use the arm against the wall to really play with how far back you can sit because this is not a kind of I always tell people don't be polite about it when you stick your butt out right really go for it get that length into the belly line and the depth in your groins and that's when you're really going to start to feel the hips and the tone of the legs give you more healthy range of motion now one more balance pose I actually want you to use the wall to give you a little bit different feedback in the upper ribs so it's called infinity pose, and if you've ever seen tree pose, it's not that, <laughs> right? So I'm not gonna bring your foot to the inner thigh and knee out. I'm actually gonna bring your foot to the front of the knee and forward. So the knees are a little bit more narrow, which makes it a little trickier for the hips to stay untucked. But we've already gone into this more open position, the square figure four leg, and now we're gonna go into this infinity position where you really gotta work the groins. And then you can do the same action like we did before, holding the knee with your two arms, that allows the groins to deepen. So you can get a little interlace, standing leg is bent deeply, send your hips back deeply. So really go for those extremes to give yourself that tone of support. Then as you pull the elbows out and draw the knee in towards the belly, you can send your hips back. Now, from there, keeping the legs steady, the rooted hips, you can go ecstasy and rise up into that back bend. Now, to use the wall, this is a nice thing to make sure that your, backs, your back ribs are not collapsing in your back bend, and you're not just throwing your head back. So one hand on dome, high above, or just above the shoulder, it doesn't wanna to be too high, but just above the shoulder, so that you can constantly move the ribs away from your wrists. This is really helpful for radiant heart. Then the opposite hand comes into ecstasy. So as I'm moving my ribs back and I'm pulling my hand forward, I can press my head back and then push my opposite arm into the wall. And then that really gives me a support for the back ribs so that as I root exhale and rise pulsing inhale, 
I really get a nice supported back bend, and I keep that opposite arm and V vector forward to give me a long stretch through the belly and to keep my ribs really full. Again, you don't have to go very far back into it. When you come out, go slow, step your feet wide again, and bring your hands into recovery pose. Find your breath, and just feel that opening that you just created along the front of the body. And it's so nice and so supported with the legs underneath and behind you with your hips, the ribs full and the arms toning to keep that oppositional tug of love between the lower and the upper halves of the body. One more side. So you're gonna step the other leg up. In this case for me, it's gonna be the left. My heel goes just above the knee and I try to keep a little ankle hollow here. So my foot is in flexion just a little bit, but my toes relaxed. Like they're almost curling over a pencil. I like to interlace just to help my ribs inflate with my arms a little lower and then pulling my knee up, pushing the bottom knee up as well into the lifted foot, I go for my rooted hips. I lead with my pubic bone down and push my glutes up rather than squeezing my low back muscles. That tends to compress the low back and actually shorten our central channel. So I'm always looking to use my base glutes and anchor through my pubic bone rather than anything happening in my low back. Elbows wide, pull up on the knee, sit rooted through the groins, and then lift the belly and chest. You can even go into a little bit of a back bend here. Then I would take right hand to the wall, left hand behind, actually I would switch that. Left hand to the wall, right hand behind the head with my left foot up. So that I'm pushing back into my right hand and pushing forward with my left hand. And then as I work the rootedness, I squeeze my knees energetically together so my groins go back. And then I drag my heels back as I rise up. Root and rise. And using the support of ecstasy arm and V vector against the wall gives you a nice opposition for your rib cage. So, a balance pose, a hip opener, a toner for the arms, and a lengthening for the belly at the beginning, and then a nice little assimilation. So, sitting back into your chair again, a position that can set you up for success, come forward to the front of your chair again. And then bring the hands into globe, or you can rest one on top of the other, but let the thumb tips tuck with a touch with a soft bend in the joints. And then close your eyes. And taking even 5, 10, 20 breaths after a work like this, keeping the template in shape so the ribs stay inflated and expanding radially. The arms stay toning gently as the shoulders lift and spread, collarbones broaden. Then the legs root. My dig drag action is still in play to keep a healthy forward tip. And the belly and the neck lengthen up as I push through the roof of the mouth. And then I breathe and honor the pulse of inhale and exhale moving through me. These are things that we do every day, and so we can take them for granted easily. But assimilating this new way of working with the body, of integrating the bones, and toning uniformly with the soft tissues, that's when we can start to find new patterns, untangle the old ways of linear movement, and really begin to explore our dimensionality. Bring your hands up a little off the thighs and globe just to remember the fullest capacity that you hold within yourself and the ever-present push and desire to keep growing. I fold our palm, we fold our palms together to culminate a moment of deep respect with such gratitude and awe for all of you for showing up and doing this work. I humbly bow. Thank you all so much. Take care of yourselves. Namaste.